Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. Looks like everything's kind of shut down at the moment. Let's see what this is about. space-time anomalies out there. You know, usually these piles of coins really aren't worth spending most of your uh, salts on, but for some reason I do it anyway. can't do anything with my salts, so... I'll just be killing them the old-fashioned way. Is it just me, or... Do the women soldiers sound just a bit more crazy than the men? Maybe they just... Maybe they're just better at screaming loudly. There you go. That should help. Huh. They won. They killed the turret. Well, whatever. That helps me out too. Ah, crap. Crap. Crap, crap, crap. I can't believe I pulled that one out. Seems like it's a running theme for me. So I get down to just that one last sliver of health and somehow pull it out anyhow. You know, this place really looks like a mess though. I mean, this can't be as recent as the start of Booker's Rampage. This place was... Must have been an absolute mess for a while now. Alright, that's a little better now. Back up to half health or so. Oil puddle. Oh, what's this? Well, I'm going to be saving up for one of the one of those expensive uh, salts benefits. So you know, every last little bit helps. Barely halfway there at this point. Now, who stores cotton candy in their, uh, cabinets? I mean, I know that's sort of a running theme with these games, just to find random food items in random places, but every once in a while I've just gotta, you know, stop and... 
ask the stupid question, you know? Them coppers came riding in on back by the lottery. Damn it. I think you'd be able to use it here. That line heads to Monument Island. The shot. Yeah, yeah. Whoa! Whoa! This is the first time we've used one of these. Get a good look at the uh, Monument Island there. Rather unfortunate. Hey, more salts. Nice. Bunch of beer, but uh, that's one of them trade off items, so. I think I'm going the wrong way. Luckily, it's pretty easy to uh, fix that. Somebody's still celebrating. Look at all that fireworks. Is no one else up here? Ah. Also, one problem with using the skylines is that, well, you're not the only passenger. And the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great, and he repented he had made man on the earth. Rain! Forty days and forty nights of the stuff, and he left not a thing that walked alive. You see, my friends, even God is entitled to a do-over. And what is Columbia if not another Ark? For another time. <laughs> He's gone to ground, he says. Unfortunate, but apparently on hard, these uh, soldiers have just enough health to avoid dying from a single headshot. All right, now let's see what else there's around here. Oddly enough, I think that distance from the balcony. There's another skyline up above. So I get some elevation, I could probably reach it. Yes, I just had some elevation. Thank you, Booker. But uh, yeah, for some reason, I believe that balcony is uh, actually high enough that you could take some damage from falling off of it. And yet, oddly enough, if you uh, if you use one of those hooks. Then, if you uh, drop down from a hook, and despite the fact that it's not really uh, protecting you in any way, you don't actually take damage. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. 
you know, the skyline item sounds useful, but I never do kill a lot of people from a skyline. At least not aside from jumping down from it. You're no match. No match, he says. You ain't got a head. So which of us is uh, in more trouble? So yeah, this place is an absolute mess too. So you gotta wonder what's happened in a lot of these areas. Because Booker cannot be responsible for all of them. Stand down! Stand down! Well now. That was surprisingly effective. No, I think Father Comstock is not technically the political leader. Sort of a situation like with Ayatollah Khamenei. Get ahead of the roof. Take that skyline to Monument Island. I know why you have come, false shepherd. I see every sin that blackens your soul. Wounded knee. The Pinkertons. The drink. The gambler. And of course, Anna. And now, to repay a debt, you've come from my land. But not all debts can be repaid, Booker. You don't know me, pal. Prophecy is my business, Mr. DeWitt. As blood is yours. You know why these men will die for me? Because I've seen their future in the glory, and hence they are content. What brought you to Columbia, Booker? Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt? This will end in blood, Wit. Then again, it always does with you, doesn't it? It always ends in blood, Wit. To lead my lamb astray, but thy crook is bent and thy path is twisted. twisted. Go back to the Sodom from which you came. I think you can start a fight with the soldiers here if you want. Just start mowing them down. I mean, you got your gun. Go back. Damn. Holy shit. Thanks for creating a path for me, I guess. I wonder where we're going. We gotta find the controls to take this thing to Monument Island. Now, one thing I'm unclear about is whether or not you are able to shoot that nun there. Because, yeah, once again, you've got your gun out. You could just fire on her. It's okay. I'm not gonna hurt you. Then again, if you do, then, uh... This sequence wouldn't happen. Okay, I'm sure I can get this thing going. The Lord forgives everything, but I'm just a prophet, so I don't have to. Amen. Amen. Jesus! You know, funny story, but one of the Old Testament prophets is kind of famous. 
because uh, for this one sequence where a bunch of kids make fun of it. And so he shouts at them, and after that a bunch of bears come up and gobble up the children. Like, quite specifically, a couple of bears appear and murder and eat all of the children. So when he says that a prophet does not have to forgive, he's, uh... He's actually got quite the biblical precedent going for him. Anyway, that's it for the gateway to Monument Island. Coming up next, the statue itself. And you know, there's something that's been playing a major role in the game so far. Something so ubiquitous, I imagine you haven't even noticed it was there. And yet it's both incredibly important to everything on screen, and it's a relatively new feature in 1912. As such, today we shall turn again to Science Corner in order to discuss the history of electricity. The Grand Collaboration Humans have known about electromagnetic effects since, basically, since we were humans. There are electrical eels, and static electricity, and of course it's hard to ignore thunder and lightning. Then there are lodestones, certain ferrous minerals which are naturally magnetized, likely thanks to lightning strikes. Lodestone needles were used in the very first magnetic compasses, a technology that's around 2,000 years old now. Then there's something called the Baghdad Batteries, a series of pots made in the early 1st millennium CE, which were found to contain a copper tube and an iron rod, and possibly some sort of acid, a set of which could potentially be used to create about half a volt of electricity. That's not much energy, but with a few pots in sequence, it's enough to very slowly electroplate a metallic surface. Of course, it's much more likely that the copper tube and iron rod were used to house religious scrolls, much like the copper tubes and iron rods found nearby, and the acidic residue is all that's left of the scrolls themselves. The true beginning of electrical theory came in 1600 CE, when William Gilbert first noted the difference between magnetism and static electricity. Later on, Hans Christian Ersted would discover that both these effects are ultimately caused by the same underlying force, but, you know, baby steps. Gilbert referred to this new effect as electricus, from the Greek word for amber, as amber was the favorite material to use to demonstrate the effects of static electricity. I imagine even those of you who don't live in the United States have heard the old story of Benjamin Franklin flying a kite in a storm in order to prove that lightning is electrical in nature? Naturally, it wasn't so simple as getting a kite into the air and waiting for a lightning bolt to strike the key tied to a string. If that's what he'd done, he would have been electrocuted. And in fact, other scientists who tried to replicate the experiment without reading all the fine details did get electrocuted, and at least one of them died. The thing is, you don't need a lightning bolt to build up a charge in a conductive string. There's enough electrical potential in the air during a storm that just flying a kite normally will gather enough voltage to send a spark between a key tied to the string and somebody's hand. His experiments with lightning led Franklin to invent the lightning rod, which works essentially the same today as it did in the 18th century. Of course, he is also responsible for naming the electrical charges positive and negative, and since the negative end is the one with the excess electrons, he plainly got that one wrong. Physics students have been suffering from confusion ever since. But the reason I called this section the Grand Collaboration is because no one person is responsible for humanity's harnessing of electricity. And the proof is in just how many electrical units have been named after different people. Volts are named after Alessandro Volta, an Italian physicist who invented the first electrochemical battery. Or the first one we can actually verify, anyhow. The Farad is named after Michael Faraday, an English chemist and inventor who discovered electrical induction, the key to converting mechanical power to electrical power and vice versa. He also invented the Faraday cage, a means of protecting an area from electromagnetic interference. 
The Watt is named after James Watt, a Scottish engineer who invented the rotational steam engine and the separate steam condenser. Hertz are named after Heinrich Hertz, the German physicist who proved Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic waves. Decibels are named after Alexander Graham Bell, a Scottish Canadian who refined the microphone and speaker, thus turning the telegraph into the telephone. And then Teslas are named after Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American who popularized alternating current, among other less practical inventions. The Auteur Scientist I think your Tesla deserves special mention, not simply because of what he did, but because of how he did it. Tesla's early history reads like a pretty typical American success story. He was born in 1856 in humble circumstances, a Serb in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And if you're not familiar with history, let's just say it was not a very good time or place to be a Serb. Nevertheless, he got a fairly decent education, moved to Budapest, Hungary to work for the Telegraph Company, and then went on to France and then the United States working for Edison Machine Works, one of the companies that predates Edison's General Electric. And yes, that's the same General Electric you're thinking of. Anyway, while Tesla apparently personally impressed Edison, it wasn't long before the former's ambitions ran into the latter's stingy rewards program, and so Tesla quit only six months after moving to New York and struck out on his own. Unfortunately, the industry he chose was arc lights, which was such a competitive field that his business partners pushed him out of his own company once he had finished installing the lighting for a single town in New Jersey. After that, since he had invested his patents in the company, Tesla had to spend some time as a repair technician and a literal ditch digger. Fortunately, it wasn't too long before he met another couple of men interested in starting a business, and this time they were more interested in alternating current than in arc lighting. In 1887, the Tesla Electric Company was formed, and by 1888, they managed to secure a contract with the newly formed Westinghouse Electric Company, a corporation that would soon become Edison's arch rival, and which also happens to be with us to this day. Admittedly, Westinghouse has been through a few more changes than GE has, and as such, it is simultaneously a nuclear power company and a subdivision of the CBS Corporation. Anyhow, the Westinghouse-Edison rivalry was founded on the War of the Currents, a competition between proponents of alternating current and direct current as methods of supplying municipalities with power. Not that it was much of a competition, at least in terms of raw stats. AC is better able to travel long distances without losing voltage, it's better able to switch voltage levels with the use of transformers, and thanks to Tesla's engine designs, AC was becoming just as easy as DC to generate. All DC really had going for it was the fact that it had come first and that Edison held the patents to DC transmission but not to AC. The situation got rather ridiculous for a while. Edison had some of his assistants electrocute a lot of stray and unwanted animals with alternating current in order to prove how dangerous it was. And to be fair, it is easier to kill someone with AC than with DC, but in either case, if you're exposed to so much as a single amp, you're not going to walk away feeling okay. Edison's publicity campaign also wound up creating the electric chair, which is and has always been a peculiarly American method of execution. Despite Edison's attempts, however, Westinghouse won a pair of major victories, first by winning the bid to power the electrical exhibit in the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and then by convincing the Niagara Falls Power Company to use two-phase AC current in 60 cycles per second to power Buffalo, New York, a decision which has defined American electrical grids to this day. After that, it wasn't long before General Electric followed suit and switched to AC transmission, whether Edison liked it or not. Unfortunately, beating Edison at his own game kind of had the effect of sticking Tesla's head up his own ass. And so as time went on, he went from inventing gradual improvements to existing technologies to 
wild, ostentatious experiments from which he would draw even wilder conclusions. Einstein would provide the classic look for mad scientists, but Tesla... Tesla provided the spirit, the my science is too avant-garde for mainstream science attitude. For instance, while Tesla was working on wireless communication, Marconi went and invented the wireless telegraph, basically the first radio transmitter. Tesla's response was to say to everyone who would listen that, oh yeah, well, some people out there are rushing to commercialize an unfinished product, but me, I'm busy perfecting the ultimate wireless transmitter, one immune to interference and interception, and which can even produce its own power. And the thing is that Tesla really was discovering fascinating new ideas and observations. You really can transmit power through the ground and through the air. Wireless charging stations are based on Tesla's principles. The thing is, it's incredibly inefficient, even over short distances, since air and earth are non-optimal conductors. And you can transmit signals through the ground using extremely low frequency waves. In the 1980s, the U.S. Navy built an ELF transmitter in Wisconsin, of all states, to communicate with submarines. Thing is, though, such transmissions require a hell of a lot more energy to reach the same distances as normal radio. And so that's how Tesla's life turned out. Too many promises, not enough results. Personal Thoughts Going back to my three technology types, I suppose electricity would be manufacturing, since it helped in so many factories. Uh, then again, you could say it's transportation, since it's transmitted from a central power plant. Or maybe it's communication, since the telegraph system predates electrical grids by a significant margin. Or perhaps electricity is proof that filing things away in little boxes is just a very convincing form of bullshit. In any case, electricity, power, has done incredible things for humanity's progress. Light bulbs, computers, modern cars, appliances, television. What used to require potentially immense amounts of physical labor could now be accomplished with the flick of a switch. Electricity is so ubiquitous that it's even penetrated to the poorest parts of the world, if only as gasoline generators and car batteries. Power. There is no more apt word for it. Electricity gives us the power to move mountains. It gives us the power to fly and to drive. It gives us the power to cook food and to preserve it. It gives me the power to transmit my voice across the entire globe. And it gives you the power to hear it. Electricity is no one man's baby. It took scientists from around the world to figure it out. As such, much like the power of the state, the power of electricity belongs to us all. Thanks for joining me again in Science Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.